right, so our last speaker for our exciting morning session is Dr. Regina Joyce Cordy from Wake Forest, who uh, I think is going to shift us slightly away from the parasite again. So we'll, we'll, we'll have another exciting talk. So that I don't do the same mistake I made with Kirk. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to. Laser pointer. Laser pointer. Okay. Oh, you'll tell me. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Regina Joyce Cordy, and I'm really honored to be here today and excited to be here as part of this event. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to the organizers for the invitation. So today, uh, what I wanted to do is talk to you about the work that our lab has been doing looking at the role of uh, exogenous amino acids in the environment of the parasitic infection and how this might impact uh, disease severity in uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria. So I won't uh, get into a lot of detail here about uh, falciparum itself. Obviously, this audience is familiar with the disease. But the point that I wanted to make is that um, we know that this uh, same parasite, Plasmodium falciparum, can manifest in a lot of different ways. It can manifest as everything from a completely asymptomatic infection, um, where people would have no symptoms, walking around fine, to uncomplicated, uh, where people have fever and more flu-like symptoms all the way to the more severe effects of severe malarial anemia, uh, seizures and coma, and uh, obviously the unfortunate death that this disease does cause. And so my lab has been really interested in trying to understand some of the factors that might be happening in the host during the course of disease that might impact disease severity. So we obviously know that host immunity and parasite factors are gonna be major factors in terms of determining this disease, of disease severity, but we've been interested if other factors play a role as well. So uh, things such as the nutrition uh, of the individual, the uh, me metabolism of the host, um, and we also have some work looking into the gut microbes. But today I really wanna to focus on our work looking at the uh, plasma metabolome. So metabolomics uh, approaches uh, have really revealed uh, these changes in host plasma metabolites during malaria infection. And a large body of work by many people, including several in this room, have really uh, led us to a lot of uh, key sort of uh, known factors of what really changes in the host during the course of a malaria infection. And so this was a topic that uh, a graduate student in my lab, uh, Heather Colvin, and I reviewed in 2020. And we really just kind of searched uh, through the literature and, and just categorize some of these findings that um, so many researchers have contributed to over the years. And so one of the things that we uh, really highlighted is that there's this big depletion in amino acids that occurs uh, in the course of malaria, um, glutamine, proline, ornithine, citrulline, arginine. Uh, some of these uh, amino acid uh, perturbations are also known to involve a conversion, a conversion event. So uh, tryptophan is converted over to canurinine through this IDO pathway, um, and that's involved in immune suppression, but also has some neurotoxic effects. There's also a lot of literature on the lipid perturbations that occur during malaria. Um, some work obviously recently has shown uh, even uh, the lysophosphatidylcholine uh, species as they are perturbed in the bloodstream. This can impact uh, gametocyte development. Uh, obviously, this disease causes a large amount of red blood cell lysis. So another factor that's uh, found in the bloodstream during these infections are heme and hemoglobin uh, breakdown products. And then also, um, there's been work to show that parasites themselves are producing some metabolites that are not normally uh, found at such high abundance during uh, uninfected states. So uh, lysine being converted to pipicolic acid is an example of that. And so today, what I wanted to talk about is uh, talk about some of the work that we published in 2019 uh, during my postdoc that I did with Mary Galinsky at Emory University, uh, where we looked at this question in in vivo systems. And we looked at uh, human cross-sectional studies as well as uh, in vivo um, non-human primate studies. And then after that, I'll transition to the work that I'm doing in my lab now at Wake Forest University, where we're really focusing in on some of the questions that we gained from doing the in vivo studies and trying to look more mechanistically at uh, some of the uh, ways in which some of these changes in the bloodstream might impact disease severity. So I'll start with the human cross-sectional study. Uh, so this work um, was done in collaboration with Jed Suman and Rapat at the Mahidol Vivax Research Unit. And the goal of the study was to look at what are the changes in the plasma metabolome that occur during the course of malaria infection. And in particular, what we also wanted to know in this study was 
what are the specific differences that occur in malaria that might even be different than other acute infectious diseases or acute illnesses? So we assume that there were probably going to be some findings that we would have that are just some, anyone that's, feb anyone that's febrile and just sort of has an acute disease might have certain changes in their um, uh, metabolome. And we wanted to be able to differentiate those uh, from healthy individuals and from those that specifically had malaria. And so uh, we followed the study design and we collected plasma from um, the individuals as you see here on this flowchart. And so our goal was to understand what are the different metabolic perturbations that are associated with plasmodium falciparum malaria. And so once we had those plasma samples, we worked in collaboration with Dean Jones Lab at the Emory Clinical Biomarkers Corps and we performed untargeted metabolomics. And so what we did was we generated this very large data set uh, using ultra high resolution mass spec. And what that does is we generated this large data table with mass to charge ratios, retention times, and intensities. So we're essentially categorizing all the chemicals based on their chemical uh, measurements, but we don't annotate them at this phase. So we're just looking at them as individual peaks uh, in mass spec. Um, then using those identifiers for those peaks, we then perform bioinformatics and biostatistics uh, algorithms to look for what are some of those specific peaks that are actually associated with plasmodium falciparum as compared to uh, non-malaria. And then, uh, of course, to get into the biology, we then take that list that we have and then we run it through different programs. So this includes network analyses where we try to find what sort, what groupings do we find of, um, of uh, metabolites, pathway analysis to try to understand what pathways might be perturbed. And then we can also assign putative annotations by looking at the um, mass to charge ratio and looking at reference uh, databases. And then once we did sort of narrow down on a couple of different pathways, we could of course confirm this data uh, using targeted mass spec and reference compounds. And so um, just to show you what that data looked like from the human cross-sectional study. So here I'm showing a principal components analysis. And what this is done for is really to understand the clustering pattern. And so what's shown here is every single icon on this graph is showing one person's metabolome. And so their whole metabolome is represented by this one icon. And we're looking for clustering patterns in the data. And so what we could see is that the individuals that did not have any kind of infection uh, were all clustered toward the right side of the graph. What we then could see is that our non-malarial febrile illness category, which at the time, this was uh, categorized by mostly undifferentiated and fe uh, influenza cases, um, those plus the plasmodium falciparum were more towards the left side of the graph. Uh, they were somewhat overlapping, but you could also see that there was some difference there. And so that caused us to wonder uh, what metabolites were actually contributing to this clustering pattern to sort of giving us this infection uh, uh, state, but also pulling away that falciparum uh, data to the bottom of the graph. And so uh, we did a number of ways of looking at this um, and they're uh, in the paper, but just to give you sort of a highlight, um, our pathway analysis really showed a very striking um, amount of amino acid pathways that were really different in the falciparum versus the non uh, cases. So we saw a large number of amino acid pathways that were changed. We saw uh, hemoglobin related uh, metabolites, and we also saw some fatty acid related metabolites. And so this is a cross-sectional study. Um, one of the great things about it is that we could see uh, in real falciparum that there were these differences in these different groups. So just where you see those different um, parts where those uh, metabolites are spread out on the graph, we could see there are real differences out there in those individuals. But it really wasn't clear to us how this affects disease progression, how those changes happen over time in a temporal way, and we really couldn't look at them as a process. And so, as I mentioned, uh, doing my postdoctoral work um, in the Galinsky lab at Emory, this was at the Yerkes Primate Research Center, we were looking at these questions and wanted to look at them in a longitudinal way. And so to do that, we wanted to uh, look at the metabolites in the plasma over the course of malaria infection. And we chose to do this in a rhesus macaque system. Um, and the goal was to see if we could understand the dynamic of some of those uh, metabolic changes and also uh, what clinical uh, factors were they associated with. And so um, here now moving to the second part of the talk, I just wanna kind of go through uh, what we were able to find with the, um, the non-human primate part of the study. So here um, we use plasmodium codonii. Um, and so this is a model uh, that we're using to uh, look, for, look at 
uh, plasmodium falciparum. Uh, so there are some commonalities, 48-hour uh, asexual life cycle, um, the animals do have fever and anemia, and for the purposes of what I was really interested in, um, the, the ability to look at acute and a chronic phase um, is something that we can do in, those, uh, in that system, and that's re been really uh, helpful for looking at the clinical side. So just to show you uh, one depiction of what one of these experiments can look like, uh, so this is a showing a uh, on the x-axis a 100-day-long time course, and on the y-axis in black dots uh, is parasitemia, in red dots is hemoglobin. And so what happens is uh, in this particular experiment, animals were inoculated with sporozoids at, day, at time point zero. Um, they then go through a pre-patent phase where the parasites are in the liver, and then. Focusing on the black dots, you can see where parasitemia starts to rise during this acute phase. So it starts to be detectable in the bloodstream. And these are samples that are taken every day from these animals. So in this particular study, the animals were given a subcurative dose of artemether uh, when they reached a high parasitemia. And then they were followed uh, for the remainder of that 100 day long time. And then what I did is I went back to this data and I went through and looked for the point at which the animals were holding 1,000 parasites per microliter or less and where it didn't go back above that line. And we drew the line at 1,000 parasites per microliter or less, trying to get an approximate of what an asymptomatic uh, infection would look like in humans. And so we defined the chronic phase as the point at which parasitemia was held at 1,000 parasites per microliter or less and didn't go above that. And the phase before that would be the post-treatment phase where it was rising and falling. Uh, when we did that definition, we could also see that hemoglobin uh, was significantly higher uh, with that definition of chronic phase. Okay, so now uh, let's see what that data looks like. So again, I'm showing a principal components analysis, and what this is showing here is uh, instead of individual uh, cases, so on the human one I had individual people, here this is an individual animal and its time point. So we had seven time points for four animals, and so each one of these time point animal combos is represented by a point. So I just wanna walk you through that. So here in the white, um, white color is all of the time point ones. So similarly for what we saw in the human, the uninfected uh, situation is basically, we see all of those time points from all four animals are clustered to the right side of the graph. Next, what we saw is that the acute phase uh, was all the way toward the left side of the graph. And uh, to our surprise, actually, it was overlapping with the post uh, sub curative treatment phase. So we initially thought that the drug effect was gonna be the largest effect that we would see. What we actually found from a metabolome point of view is that these were overlaying, but what looked really different was the chronic phase. So at this point at which parasites were maintained at this low parasitemia. And so all of the green dots are uh, essentially the time points of those different animals once they were holding 1,000 parasites per microliter or less. Another way to look at this data is in the form of a heat map. So we also did hierarchical clustering, and the clustering uh, also showed us three different clusters, and it grouped uh, the baseline samples into one cluster, it grouped the acute and post-treatment samples into another cluster, and it grouped the chronic into this final cluster here. And so, um, Again, there's more details that you can uh, read about in the paper, but uh, again, we went through that same step where we did pathway analysis, network analysis. We were able to confirm uh, metabolites using targeted mass spec. And again, we saw this enrichment of amino acid metabolism uh, changing over the course of this infection. And so the next thing we wanted to do was to pull these data sets together and say, okay, we have human cross-sectional studies with real falciparum, and then we have these more controlled longitudinal studies of uh, cotinii in the rhesus macaques. We wanted to see whether we could find a robust sort of signature of the acute and chronic phase if we looked at those uh, particular uh, two studies together and look for those different metabolic changes. And in fact, we could find some overlap. So what we did is looking between our human and our rhesus macaque study, we were able to find eight metabolites of our confirmed um, reference compound confirmed hits that actually were uh, changed in the same direction in both studies. So these were uh, two amino acids, glutamine and arginine, uh, multiple lysophosphatidylcholines, uh, multiple uh, long chain diacylPCs, and an increase in one uh, acyl carnitine. So most of these were depletions except for the acyl carnitine. Uh, 
In the chronic phase, we saw a number of different depletions, uh, different di diacyl PCs, and then a reduction of multiple sphingomyelins. And so these were also seen common across those two studies. And so this is sort of where um, I've launched off in terms of trying to answer the question of, does the plasma metabolome play a role in determining disease severity and malaria infections? So we see that if we look at the actual animals and humans, their bloodstream is going through these really dynamic changes in terms of the actual uh, nutrients. And of course, when we're thinking about the parasites and how we grow them in the lab, we have them in a very consistent condition. So I've been really curious about this question of does the plasma metabolome play a role in determining disease severity? And so uh, what we decided to do was actually just focus on one of these metabolites. Uh, well, we have some other work on a couple of the other ones, but this is the main one I wanted to talk about today, um, is our focus on glutamine. And so uh, glutamine came up in our study as one of those um, where we saw the overlap. And um, in fact, there was previous literature already out there suggesting that glutamine um, may play a role in severe malarial anemia. So DJ Perkins' lab had shown uh, that severe malarial anemia was previously associated with low plasma glutamine levels in this cross-sectional study of pediatric cases in Kenya. So all of these children had plasmodium falciparum, but the individuals that had severe malarial anemia were found to have significantly lower glutamine in their bloodstream. And so uh, another reason that glutamine was an attractive um, path to follow is that Glutamine itself is actually already a US FDA approved uh, treatment for sickle cell disease. So 2017, this was uh, moved through the FDA. Um, it's used as a, a secondary treatment in addition to hydroxyurea. But importantly, what it's used for is to reduce oxidative stress in the red blood cells. And so thinking that both sickle cell disease and severe malarial anemia are these diseases that cause a lot of oxidative damage to red blood cells, um, we were curious about uh, how these uh, amino acids might impact their uh, function. So the question of does the availability of plasma glutamine impact the function of red blood cells during the acute phase is where we turn next. And so to do that, we then uh, decided to kind of work uh, in the lab, so at Wake Forest. Um, and now I'm gonna be showing work from uh, Heather Colvin Binns, uh, who is a, a graduate student in my lab that uh, recently defended her PhD actually. Um, and so I'm gonna show uh, her work here. So here, um, what we're really trying to focus on is saying, if we are interested in severe malarial anemia, there's multiple mechanisms that are underlying malarial anemia, including dyserythropoiesis, direct lysis from the parasite. But there's also this effect called bystander effect, where there's this large loss of uninfected red blood cells. And so uh, we were curious about looking at that in the lab. And so going back to why is glutamine being used, um, in sickle cell, we looked at this uh, pathway of what is the red blood cell actually doing with it. So it's obviously not a, it doesn't have a nucleus, but what we know is that it does take up these amino acids, including glutamine, uh, glycine, and cysteine, and it can take them and use them to produce intracellular glutathione. And so this is something that the, parasite, that the red blood cell can really use to actually combat oxidative stress. So this is the underlying idea behind using uh, glutamine as a treatment for sickle cell disease. And so um, our approach, we wanted to expose cells to oxidative stress uh, to mimic the oxidative environment of a malaria infection, and then evaluate the morphology and function thereafter. And then attempt to alleviate this negative impact of oxidative stress on cells by providing this elevated levels of exogenous amino acids. Okay, so for us to study this effect, what we did is we, of course, grew a plasmodium falciparum culture um, in flasks, and we incubated it with healthy red blood cells but what we did first was we actually uh, incubated these cells with catalase. We, we treated them with, sorry, sodium azide to block catalase. And the reason we did that is that the cells will uh, use catalase as a first pass to try to deal with oxidative stress. But in malaria, the thought of acute malaria is that they're probably dealing with so much oxidative stress that that's getting used up and they're gonna to need to produce glutathione. So we basically mimic this situation where they're in this already stressed state and then incubate them with the spent media from a culture, from a falciparum culture. And so what we saw when we did that is um, we were able to see this uh, real increase in echinocytosis that occurs um, if you compare the uh, cells that are in the non uh, 
um, spent media versus the spent media condition. And the kinocytes are these spiked looking red blood cells. Um, and so what we saw is a higher number of them um, in that culture condition. So based on scanning EM, we could see that morphology. And so we then wanted to know whether this was a redox related effect, because if it's a redox related effect, then it could be really connecting in some way to um, the, what's being looked at in sickle cell disease. And so um, to look at whether it's a redox effect, we uh, started off just doing these proof of concept studies using hydrogen peroxide. So this was just to kind of get things going in the lab and uh, make sure we could uh, do these techniques. So essentially what we were doing is using this reagent called H2DCFDA. Um, and what this is, is you incubate your cells with it. Um, when there's no reactive oxygen species, it does not fluoresce. Um, but once there are reactive oxygen species, it does fluoresce. And so you can measure uh, intracellular ROS that way. And so uh, what we did is we looked at um, hydrogen peroxide stressed red blood cells. And as predicted, we see this increase in the intracellular ROS. And we could see that in the microscope and we could measure it by flow cytometry. Um, and here's the data. OK, but that's just hydrogen peroxide. What we're really interested in is this idea of spent media and the falciparum infection. So again, we did actually do this experiment with spent media, and we did see that change. We did see uh, a difference in terms of the actual amount of uh, plasmodium falciparum, uh, the, the increase that was seen uh, when we looked at uh, reactive oxygen species in there as well. And so we could then, at that point, basically see that both in the hydrogen peroxide and the spent media, uh, that either way, those conditions in our stressed red cell um, uh, experiment were in, having an increased amount of intracellular reactive oxygen species. So then our question became, well, does the exogenous environment, so kind of going back to this idea of having these different kind of contents in, their, in the bloodstream, um, does this have an impact on how they might actually be able to sort of combat this? So what we did is we uh, incubated the cells with um, QCGs, just an abbreviation I'm using for glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. Um, so those were the components that would be, uh, could be used as building blocks for glutathione production inside the red blood cell. And what we did see is that we could actually find a significant decrease um, in the reactive oxygen species in hydrogen peroxide. Um, and we saw that most with the highest amount that we treated it with. We then, of course, wanted to move over to spent media. Um, and in spent media, we could also see uh, that um, change. So basically, once the cells are in spent media, we see it, it, uh, ROS is elevated. And then when we uh, incubate them with this um, QCG, we see that coming down. Um, and so then to actually understand it coming down is one thing, but this is really just looking at ROS, looking at echinocytes. It doesn't actually tell us whether it, the cells actually made glutathione. So then to figure that out, we then turn back to mass spec um, and we wanted to look at the amount of total glutathione in these cells. So uh, we also did that both with hydrogen peroxide and with spent media. And here's what we actually found, which was pretty interesting, is that um, we find that the cells do produce more glutathione when they have the QCG, but it's with or without stress. So it happens regardless. It happens in the control, it happens in hydrogen peroxide, and then it also happens in spent media. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that it suggests that incubation with the QCG results in this increased production of glutathione, regardless of whether the cells are under this stress. So to understand more about the dynamic, we did live cell imaging. Um, and so just the way that this looks is if we're incubating it with uh, PBS, we don't see a lot of intracellular ROS, but we can also measure the increase in hydrogen peroxide being added at this red line. And then we uh, wanted to know how QCG would affect that timing. And so what we did here is we actually did uh, those two experiments side by side, and we could see that there was a lower amount of total uh, intracellular ROS that happened in those uh, cells that were incubated with QCG. So just to wrap up, um, some a working model that we're kind of trying to uh, work through and figure out is this idea that amino acids might have some effect on this red blood cell function. The thought would be that if there's lower glutamine in the blood, that's less um, building blocks for this glutathione uh, synthesis. And that could sort of allow this really rapid um, increase in intracellular mm -hmm. ROS once the catalase is gone. Um, and that might lead to this higher rate of echinocytosis, which would then cause those cells to be, deform be deformed and rigid enough that they would get stuck in the spleen, which, in which case you would lose them. 
uh, a higher amount of glutamine in the blood could have higher uh, glutathione production, a little bit less, although there is still obviously some intracellular ROS, and then a lower rate of echinocytosis. Um, and so that's uh, overall what we're um, looking at. I'm gonna kind of just skip to the, um, the end here is that we're also looking at ongoing um, work to try to understand how different contributors of the bystander effect um, how the QCG uh, might work with those. Uh, so just to uh, wrap up, I just wanna acknowledge in particular, uh, Heather Colvin Vins, who's shown here, um, who really has been driving this work in our research lab, um, and all of the different investigators at different universities, and um, particularly the help from the NHLBI uh, Pride program and the mentorship that I've gotten through there uh, on the red blood cell side. And happy to take questions. Jürgen Bosch, Case Western. Great talk. Um, how does the parasite glutathione system change upon addition of uh, your amino acids? Yeah, so we haven't looked at that yet, but that's actually another project that our lab is going to start working on, is trying to look at similar ideas, but with the parasite, and basically try to understand parasite growth rate relative to some of these changes. Don't have a lot of data there uh, right now, but um, that's definitely something that we're interested in. Have you looked at infected red cells, how, how your um, reporter works there? How, like oh, yeah. Infected versus um, uninfected? We're starting to do that now. Yeah, basically take the cells that are the result of those experiments and then culture parasites. And we are doing it. Don't have a lot of data yet, but that's something we're really interested in is thinking about what is, what is the result of that? So if there are cells that went through these different environments, how does that affect the parasite growth in them? Uh, we don't know yet, but we are trying to look at that. <laughs> Sorry, Peter Augury, Johns Hopkins. That's a wonderful talk. I wonder if this system is sensitive enough to detect small levels of changes in neuroact neuroactive amines like dopamine. Oh, uh, you mean the so more of the first part of the talk? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that we, if we have, um, we often have basically uh, when we look at the mass to charge ratios and we find these hits that we have some level of confidence in, the main key is being able to do, then rerun it with the reference compound. When we have the untargeted data, we actually do get a lot of hits that are in a wide range of pathways. One of the reasons that you know, we could really focus on amino acids is because it was such a dominant path, but it's by no means um, you know, the whole story. There's so much more in that database in terms of what's, what else is changing. Thank you. This is a wonderful session. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't know that it's actually relate um, in the same. Oh, oh. Right. So the question was: um, it, Are the are the the amount of glutamine that you would see in individuals that were malnourished uh, or properly nourished? Uh, are we measuring sort of in that range? Is that about right? So I can't say whether we're, we're measuring in the range of how nourishment would affect it, but what we did do is we looked at the amounts in the pediatric Kenya study and in our animals. And so we can say that we're looking at the ranges within malaria. And I think there's many reasons why in malaria the glutamine could drop because it's being used up by other cell types in the immune system. So it's not to say that nutrition itself might be the reason, but in malaria, there you know there is going to be that range. So that's the range that we picked. Joel Vega, NIH. Uh, beautiful work, Regina. I'm wondering if you looked at the other antioxidant pathways on the red blood cells, like the thyroidoxin or their building blocks. 
we haven't looked at them yet. Yeah, that's a question that um, we get a lot, especially from the redox biology group that we collaborate with. And so I think it's probably just a future project that we'll eventually look into. Yeah. <laughs> 